Ladies and gentlemen, it is time to defend the Sabbath. Here we go. All right, it is time to defend the Sabbath. Jim Staley here with Passion for Truth Ministries. I'm excited about today's broadcast. Today we are going to be talking about what does it mean uh, to keep the Sabbath in the in the United States, in America, in the world today? Should Christians keep the Sabbath? What about Romans chapter 14 when it says that you can pick any day that you want? What about Acts chapter 15 when it only says that these are the four things that you need to do? What about the fact that the Sabbath is the only commandment and the Ten Commandments that aren't found is not found in the New Testament? Doesn't that mean that we shouldn't keep the, 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 the Shabbat? We're going to answer every question that I can think of, ladies and gentlemen, in this multi-part series on defending the Sabbath. It's time that we know the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that's what we're going to do. So put your questions in the chat, anything that anyone has ever come up against you and said, hey, what about Galatians chapter 5? What does this mean? Uh, doesn't this mean that we shouldn't keep the Sabbath? We're going to dispel a lot of, of misunderstandings, a lot of myths that are inside the scriptures when we're talking about the Sabbath themselves, okay, with, when we're talking about the Sabbath. There's a lot of misunderstanding on this. I have written an entire detailed academic book on this subject. It is not published yet. It is almost finished. And I have just been praying, God, give me the time to finish this book. You'll know it when it comes out. I go through every single scripture in the Bible uh, in referencing the, the, the Sabbath and, uh, and the idea that we shouldn't keep the Sabbath and then all the supporting evidence for keeping the Sabbath. So we're going to dive into that today. So without further ado, the first question that comes up is, uh, we should only keep the laws that are repeated in the New Testament. All of the Ten Commandments are found in the New Testament except for the commandment to keep the Sabbath. And so this is a very popular argument amongst Christians and Christian pastors uh, that that is predisposed to already the straw man argument that sets it up saying that the law is it has to be repeated in the New Testament that actually to actually follow it. So you from the very beginning, this is really important, you guys. It is not uh, it is man's tradition that has created the rule, the fake rule that says it has to be repeated in the New Testament. Who where's the commandment that says that it has to be repeated in the New Testament? Uh, for you to keep it. This is an interesting uh, argument because uh, it just doesn't hold water. Let me give you an example. Let's go to Mark chapter 2, verse 27, and, uh, and, and you're going to see that this argument falls apart very, very quickly. Let me just pull, pull this up for you. What did I say? Mark 2, 27. And you're going to see that not only is the rule itself completely set up uh, from a fallacy, it's a straw man argument that assumes that that that's true, which it's not, because there's no supporting evidence in all of the Bible that says that uh, you know there's no prophet that said, hey, if if this is not repeated in the New Testament, you don't have to do it. Okay, that would that would be pretty crazy. There's a ton of scripture that is in the Old Testament that is so worthy, okay, for doctrine uh, and reproof, but uh, that is not found. Uh, in the New Testament. So uh, let's go, actually, thank you, Lord. Let's go to that scripture right now. And I believe that is out of Timothy. There we go. Okay. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Check this out. We're talking about we're talking about in the New Testament. In the New Testament, we have the author of Timothy telling us here, God breathed that all scripture is worthy for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. Now, let me ask you this. In the New Testament, when Timothy was written, the new did the New Testament even exist? Of course not. It didn't. So what is the scripture that he's referring to? The Old Testament. 
he's talking about the Old Testament. So this one scripture dispels this argument that everything in the New Testament for Christian life, it must be found in the New Testament. That is not at all what the New Testament says. As a matter of fact, it's the opposite. They didn't have the New Testament. So what did the New Testament uh, disciples do uh, without the New Testament? Uh, did they not follow the Sabbath? Did they not follow uh, the, the scriptural, uh, the commandments that are found in what they considered the Hebrew scriptures or to them just the scripture? Uh, you see, this is a 21st century Western Greco-Roman mindset that's, that makes up stuff that says, hey, we only follow things that are found in the New Testament that are repeated out of the Old Testament when that doesn't exist at all. So now let me go back to where I originally wanted to go and show you that the Sabbath is absolutely repeated in the New Testament, and it's just a little bit hidden. So let's do this. Let's go to Mark chapter 2, because that's where I originally was going to go. And let's go down to verse 27. All right, there's a dialogue here where Yeshua is talking about the Sabbath, and uh, uh, he's questioned about Sabbath, and, uh, and they're walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. So let's just hit this all at one time here. He's walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath. And uh, they went, his disciples began to pluck, pluck the heads of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? But he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was in need and hungry? He and those with him, how he went into the house of God in the days of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the showbread, which is not lawful to eat except for the priest, and also gave some to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, this is a really important scripture because number one, uh, there's another question that we were going to answer er uh, later. Let's go ahead and answer it now, uh, saying that didn't Jesus break the Sabbath in the scripture? May it never be. If, if, if Jesus breaks the Sabbath during his lifetime, then he has committed a sin because 1 John 3, 4 says sin is the transgression or the breaking of God's law. And Sabbath is the fourth commandment. And so he had not died yet. So according to Christian doctrine, uh, the new covenant hadn't even started yet until the resurrection, which means he's under the old covenant according to traditional uh, Christian uh, doctrine. And if Jesus breaks the Sabbath here, he becomes a sinner and disqualifies himself from being the Messiah. No, what's happening here is there was a oral law, a tradition of the elders that said you're not allowed to take a single grain of wheat and thresh it in front of your fingers, with your fingers, or you're breaking the Shabbat. Yeshua was saying, look, no, we're not breaking the Sabbath. Life is the most, most important thing. You can break any commandment based on life. That's why you can defend yourself and you can kill someone in your house that tries to rob you, according to scripture, and threatens your life because life is on the line. You can do anything as long as it is, it is life is on the line. And, and so they're hungry. Their, their life is more important than the Sabbath itself. There's nothing wrong. And there's no scripture commanding you to not uh, take some, some wheat for crying out loud and, and eat it, uh, you know, off, off of the stalk. So he makes this unbelievable and unprecedented statement in verse 27 of Mark chapter two. And he says, the Sabbath was made for man, man was, was, excuse me, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Now, this is a, a bit elusive, okay, but the academic mind that is used to looking at the scriptures uh, can see this blaring. This is Yeshua advocating for the fourth commandment. He is bringing it into the New Testament times, and he is telling us the original intent of God. He is not taking away the Sabbath. He is enforcing it. He is underlining it. He is making it bold in italics. He is highlighting the original intent of the Sabbath was made for man. And because the Sabbath is on the seventh day, according to the Torah in Exodus chapter 28, excuse me, 20, verse 8 through 11, we know that we can reread this and say the seventh day was made for man. Period. That's it. The Sabbath was made for man. In other words, all these traditions that the elders were adding onto it are irrelevant. They don't need to be there. They're bogging down 
this commandment. And it's causing people to feel like they're serving the Sabbath, that they got to do it just right or, or, or it's not going to work. And that doesn't bring life. So Jesus, Yeshua here, is bringing the fourth commandment into the New Testament and letting them know it's important. It's so important. I'm going to remove all of the traditions of the elders, and I'm going to say, look, it's just made for man from the very beginning, before man sinned. If man doesn't sin, we're not even having this conversation because everyone would be keeping the Sabbath because God exemplified it on the seventh day. He set it apart and he made it holy. Okay. All right. Another, another proof text of the Sabbath in the New Testament absolutely is Acts chapter 15. Let's go there because uh, this is powerful. Okay. Acts chapter 15 And we're going to scroll down to verse 20. And this is the most popular part. Uh, There's, there's, there, this is the most popular verse. One of the most popular verses in the New Testament that, that traditional Christian apologists will bring up saying that Gentiles don't have to keep God's law. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. And here's why, because Acts chapter 15 says that it only gives four things that Gentiles should do. So let's read those four things. Let's put on our thinking cap and see what we come out of it. Verse 20 says this. This is, by the way, Acts chapter 15 is not about Christian living at all. It is not about how to live for Christ. It is not about what you should do for Christ. It's about what is needed for salvation. The whole debate that Paul has when he goes up to the church of, of council in Jerusalem is what does it mean to be saved as a Gentile? How do we know that? Because we simply go up here to uh, chapter 15. Let me turn on the scripture here so you can see it. And it says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, saying, Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This is the debate, ladies and gentlemen. It's whether or not you can be saved and not be circumcised. So they went up to ask the people, the apostles and elders about this question. What does it mean to be saved? And all through that, if you read it from that perspective, which is the correct interpretation of Acts 15, you get to verse 20. And after the debate has been made and both sides have pre- presented their cause, James, the president, the Nazi of the council of Jerusalem stands up from the Bema seat And he makes this statement, and it is not about Christian living. It's about salvation. Watch and listen carefully. He says this, known to God from eternity, I'll start in verse 18, are all his works. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled and from blood. Okay, let's stop there for right now. The whole entire argument is about salvation. And he is making four statements that says they can't do this and maintain salvation. They cannot be saved if they do these things. If we are to believe as believers in Christ that what James is saying is these four things are the only things that Gentiles need to do, then this is good news for everybody that sits in a local church. You don't have to tithe. As a matter of fact, you don't even need to love your neighbor as yourself. You don't even need to love God uh, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, because that's not in the verse either. You just need to make sure that you abstain from things polluted by idols, sexual immorality uh, from things strangled. That doesn't happen every day. And from blood, no one's drinking blood today. So ultimately Gentiles don't have to do anything anything, if this is the standard, ladies and gentlemen, is Acts chapter 15, verse 20. No, this is a really good pastor that is saying, look, these guys are coming to know Christ. There's some giant issues with polygamy. I mean, with, with, uh, with, uh, 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 multi, they're serving multiple gods and, uh, and they're all this sexual immorality that's in temple prostitution and they're drinking blood as cult, uh, as, as the cults are doing to their gods. They can't do these things. They have to immediately stop these things. But don't worry, okay? They'll learn the rest every week when they come to church. And this is what I wanted to bring up. This proves that the Sabbath 
was instituted in the New Testament times and that it was expected for Gentiles to keep it. It's the very next verse. It says it right here. Verse 21, for Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. What is being said right here, ladies and gentlemen, is that James is saying, look, these four things they got to abstain from. They can't do these things. They'll learn the rest of Christian living in every synagogue every Sabbath. The Torah is preached. That's, that's what he means by Moses is preached. The Torah is taught every single week in the synagogue every Shabbat. Okay? And so it is expected in the minds of James and the apostles that this is just where they're going to go to church. It's when they're going to go to church. It's in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Is there any more proof for that? Absolutely there is. It is found in Acts chapter 13. So we can back up just a little bit. And verse 42, for those of you that are keeping, uh, keeping, keeping uh, notes, excuse me, Trying to multitask on a live is not exactly easy. And look at this. This is amazing. In verse 42, let's, let's go back, <clears throat> show you what this looks like. I'll highlight it for you. And he says, so when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them next Sabbath. So wait a minute. What are the Gentiles doing in the synagogue on the Sabbath? Okay. So the Gentiles are begging to be taught the next Sabbath. That presupposes that they already know that this is when they're going to church is on Saturday. It's on the seventh day on the Sabbath. Now watch this. It gets better. Now, when the congregation had broken up, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. Are you, are you kidding me right now? Almost the whole city on the next Sabbath. Now, why is it that Paul didn't just go to the Gentiles the next day? Why didn't he go to their church service on the first day of the week or on Sunday? Because they weren't meeting on Sunday. They were meeting on Saturdays, and that's when the gospel was given. Uh, and, and so that's why in verse 44 it says, on the next Sabbath, Almost the whole city came together to hear the word of God. I love that. And so there's many more that I could bring up, but I wanted to just show you that in this very first, that I'm spending a lot of time on this first question, which is, <clears throat> or I should say the first myth, which is we don't have to keep a commandment unless it's found duplicated in the New Testament. That's simply not the case. It's all over the New Testament. What traditional Christians are looking for is a commandment in this form, thou shall keep the Sabbath. But it doesn't dawn on them that the Sabbath is all over the place in the New Testament, and it's assumed because they're already keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day, just like they did all throughout the book of Acts. Yeshua is talking about the Sabbath as if it, everybody knows about it. Why would they ever have to say, hey, you need to keep the Sabbath if everyone's already keeping it? And so it's important to bring that up and understand that, okay? <clears throat> All right, uh, let's go to the next question here. What's the next question? Um, yeah, we talked about Acts chapter 15, verse 20. Let's go to Romans 14. I don't know what's in my throat today, but I can't get it out. All right, so let's go to Romans chapter 14. This one is brought up consistently. All right, and so verse 5 says this. Let's go over here. I want you to read this because this is brought up a lot. Uh, the, the, the myth is, hey, look, Paul says in Romans 14 that one day, let's read it, one person esteems one day <clears throat> above another. Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. <coughs> now, the, the, the argument goes like this. The argument goes, look, right here, it's very clear. You can choose any day you want for the Sabbath. 
Here's the rebuttal to that. Where in this chapter is it remotely talking about the Sabbath at all? It's a massive assumption. It's not there. As a matter of fact, the entire subject matter is about food. So if I was talking about food and I talked about you can eat or not eat, and I, then I said, hey, you can choose any day that you want, uh, wh whatever you want to choose. If I was talking in the context of food and I mentioned a day where I said, uh, he who wants to observe it can, can do it. If you don't, you don't have to. What am I talking about? I'm talking about fasting. That's what's going on. And that's why the context is talking about food. And the very next verse is a dead giveaway. Let's look at it again so you can see it. He who observes the day does it to the Lord, right? It says in verse six, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. Watch the very last part of the verse is never mentioned. He who eats, eats to the Lord for he gives thanks. And he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives thanks uh, and gives God thanks for none lives to himself. No one dies himself. We're all living to Christ, right? And so look, the whole context here of Romans chapter 14 is this issue of the debate of whether or not you should eat something that's been sacrificed to an idol. There's meat hanging out in the market uh, and they don't know if this meats, uh, this, this clean meat, by the way, uh, the sheep, the goats, they don't know if it's been sacrificed uh, to another idol because remember the Greeks, the Romans, the Jews, they're all in the same place, all right? This is during the time of Roman occupation. So the markets are out there and the Gentiles don't know. They know they're not supposed to eat anything that's sacrificed to idol. James just gave that instruction in Acts chapter 15. And so they're kind of freaked out about it. They're like the new messianic that says, I need to keep the law of God. I don't know whether this meat is sacrificed to an idol. What should I do? And Paul says, look, uh, some of you are, are deciding to only eat vegetables all right, because of this, you're becoming a vegetarian because you have found there's no way to know and you don't want to be convicted of eating something that might have been sacrificed to an idol. Other, uh, others of you have no problem with it. Okay, and, and then there's another problem is some of you are arguing about fasting uh, and they had huge arguments about whether which days you should fast in the New Testament. Should I fast on Tuesdays and Thursdays or Mondays and Fridays? And so at the end of the day, Paul solves this entire argument which is all around food and says, look, none of this matters. An idol doesn't matter. Uh, what really matters is, is following God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. As long as you're eating clean food, uh, it, it, there is no such thing as an idol. An idol is not going to be anything. And, and you guys are making too big a deal over all of this. It doesn't break any commandment at all. Uh, and, uh, if you want to fast on Mondays and Thursdays, great. If you want to eat, eat, if you don't want to eat, don't eat. But the context here is not to do with the Sabbath at all. And so to infuse the Sabbath into Romans chapter 14 is just bad exegesis. It's a bad rendering. It's very faulty uh, and it's suspicious at the very least. There's just no, uh, evidence here uh, to even hint that we're talking about about the Sabbath. Okay. And so, uh, let's see. So that's, that's that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this particular person pastor on his video had made the, the statement, if we're going to take on the law of the weekly Sabbath, then you should also keep the seven year, uh, uh, land Sabbath and let all the prisoners go and cancel all debts. Uh, I agree. Wouldn't that be great? I would have loved for that to happen when I was in a prison cell, for sure. Uh, but we the reason why that's a straw man is we don't live in a theocracy. If we lived in a theocracy where God's law was the supreme authority and the king's job was to uh, render out that law in real time, then we absolutely would be doing that. But we don't live in the land, which the, the, the Shemitah law and the law of the Sabbath, the land Sabbath is specifically about Israel and the land, although there's principles there that could be used at, at, at all times uh, anywhere. Uh, but we don't live in the land and we're not under a theocracy. So, but we can keep the Sabbath everywhere and in every culture and in every time period. And so, by the way, if you're new to this channel, would you do us a favor right now? 
would you just subscribe uh, to our channel right now? It's the biggest uh, way that you can say thank you to stay uh, ahead of the game and, and make sure that you uh, get every single video that we put out here at Passion for Truth. But you have to turn on the notification. If you're not, if your notifications aren't turned on, you have no idea uh, what we're doing here. You're just accidentally finding us. So please, if you look down right below this video player, if that subscribe, excuse me, that notification button is not turned on, then that means that you're not getting notifications. So check that to make sure that you uh, you stay notified of every video that we put out. Okay. All right. Um, love this. How about the yoke of bondage? Let's talk about that just for a second. He mentioned this isn't going back under the Sabbath, uh, going back under the yoke of bondage. And that's really important that we talk about that because this is brought out quite a bit. This is a direct quote from uh, Galatians chapter five. So let's talk about Galatians five just for a moment. Let's go there and let's dispel this as well. This scripture in Galatians five is used emphatically to prove that we do not have to keep the law. As a matter of fact, it's bondage and it's a yoke that we can't handle and so on and so forth. Look, this is so far from the truth. It gets frustrating as a Christian apologist now that understands the Hebraic context, the language, the idiomatic expressions, the cultural backdrop from which these words are found. We cannot extract words or phrases or verses out of the Bible and remove them from their cultural context, much less remove them from the chapteral uh, context or the book context. And so what do I mean by that? The entire book of Galatians is not about Christian living. It's about, again, salvation. There was a giant conversation and debate in the New Testament about this circumcision and should Gentiles be circumcised and, and, and they, are they even saved if they're not circumcised and keep the law of Moses? Because for centuries, they've always believed that the mark of a covenant believer uh, with the with the the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was circumcision, right? I mean, that was a big deal. Moses almost got killed over it, right? Because his sons weren't circumcised. Zipporah had to come along and say, Mo, get out of the way. I, I got work to do here. We're all going to die. So I get it. Circumcision was crazy important, all right? So th that predicated them to create the laws that you cannot even be in covenant at all with God as a Christian without circumcision. And so a group of people were coming down from Jerusalem, bothering the churches of Galatia that Paul founded and telling them, look, none of you, Paul is wrong. None of y'all are even saved. You're, you're not circumcised at all. And so this idea Paul was railing against because it's absolutely works-based righteousness. It is not salvific at all, has nothing to do with faith. And it was all about, hey, you could do, you could, as long as you keep the law, you're saved. And it removed Jesus Christ, Yeshua, from, the, from, uh, from being Messiah and from the formula of salvation at all. And so under this context, we come to uh, Galatians chapter 5, and he says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. All right? Well, let's go back here. Why does he say this? Do not be entangled again in the yoke of bondage. What's the yoke of bondage he's referring to? The yoke of bondage that he's referring to is the idea that you can be saved by being circumcised and keeping the law of Moses or the traditions of the elders uh, in, in their halakha, any of it. That's bondage. And he, and he says earlier in the book that, uh, look, why are you turning back? to these things that put you in bondage. Now, these Gentiles were never Jews before. So how could they be turning back to the yoke of bondage? They were, uh, they were, uh, uh, they, they had served other gods in paganism. And so Paul is uniquely and creatively connecting what the circumcision party is trying to do to how they used to be in bondage in paganism. It's the same thing. The priest in paganism put them in bondage by saying you need to do this in order for the gods to accept you. The circumcision party was doing the same thing in Judaism. You need to do these things for God to accept you. And he says, it's all the same thing. It's all, it's 
all pagan. The idea that you are saved through circumcision is not biblical. It is, in fact, bondage. And he says, if you're going to believe that, that circumcision saves you, then by the way, you have to keep the whole law. And so there's a lot of Christians out there that, that have been told that, that if you're going to follow the Sabbath, then you need to follow the whole law. Well, that's true. If you're using the Sabbath for salvation, okay? But salvation has nothing to do with keeping the Sabbath. Salvation has everything to do with your belief in Yeshua and his, in his work on the cross. Amen? That's the gospel, all right? So that's important for us to know that the whole yoke of bondage is not the law. It's keeping the law for salvation. That's bondage. You know why? Because you can't do it. Nobody can keep all of the law. It's not possible. That's why he says, if you're going to lean on keeping the Shabbat or circumcision for salvation, for justification, which is what justification means, it means to be saved, uh, then uh, you got to keep all of it. It's every one of us from Adam till now that have fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23, and deserve death, Romans 6.23. And if we don't believe in Christ, Romans 10.9 and 10, uh, and, and call upon his name with our mouth, we can't be saved. We are leaning upon the one who brought us salvation by keeping the law perfectly. It doesn't mean we get out of keeping the law. It means that now when we break it, we're no longer condemned, Romans 8, chapter, uh, at chapter 8, verse 1, okay? Lots to be said on that. All right, uh, here's another one. We are not Israel, so therefore, because the Sabbath was only given to Israel, why should we keep the Sabbath? We don't have to keep the Sabbath if we're not Israel. The Sabbath was only given to Israel. Are we sure about that? Because all the way back in the book of Genesis, when God says, I'm setting apart the Sabbath and I'm making it holy. And he gave it to, it to, to, to Adam and Eve. They had not sinned yet. This was just in Genesis chapter one and two, when he creates the heavens and the earth, he rests on the seventh day and he tells his people by example, this is the day that I've set apart. If man doesn't sin, ladies and gentlemen, Again, we're not even having this conversation. Everyone is keeping the Sabbath on the seventh day because God hallowed it. And what he sets apart, we set apart because our job is to be set apart like him. Be holy as I am holy, uh, says the Lord. Not only is that the case, but Ephesians chapter 2 gives us a better answer for those that are really into the New Testament and saying, hey, we are New Testament only Christians. Well, New Testament says that we need to keep the Sabbath as well because it says you are part of Israel. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 says this. Let's take a look at it. Ladies and gentlemen, look at the highlight. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, uh, the Jews are, the, are called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. What does this mean? He says, look, you were Gentiles. You had no ability to be a part of the commonwealth of Israel. He says, you were aliens of the commonwealth of Israel, but through Christ, you are now brought near. Near to what? The commonwealth of Israel. He says, you used to be having no ability to be a part of the covenants of Israel, but now you can through Christ. You were, you were divorced through your disobedience, but now through the blood of Christ and forgiveness, you can be brought into covenant with Israel. Israel. You are part of the commonwealth of Israel. So the idea that God only gave the Sabbath to Israel is false on multiple accounts. One, it was given in Genesis. Two, uh, Paul says here in the book of Ephesians uh, chapter two, that the Gentiles are part of the commonwealth of Israel and subject to the covenants of promise. And the Sabbath is one of those promises that brings life. Amen. Let's go over to Romans chapter eight. 
I, I'm fired up about this, you guys. Uh, we've got to learn how to defend what we believe in love and rightly divide the word of truth. It's time that we as believers rightly divide it. Let's go over to chapter 8 and go down to verse 6. And it's going to say this. Let me show you so you can see it here. Show my screen. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity. What is enmity? Hatred against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. My friends, this is extraordinary. Paul is making the statement, if you are not subject to the law of God, you're carnal. He says, and you can't please God. This is in the New Testament. Paul is saying even up here in chapter 7, I believe in verse 21 or 22. Where is it? Uh, yes. Yes. Verse 22 of Romans chapter 7. Look at this. This is incredible. He says, For I find a law that's evil is present within me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the internal inward man. But I see another law in my members, which is warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin and death. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. He delivered me from the law of sin and death, not from God's law, from the law of sin and death. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't even think we need another scripture. I could stop the broadcast right here. The Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle that we say is the apostle to the Gentiles, literally just dropped the mic and exposed his entire heart's desire is to serve the law of God. Now, in the New Testament, when there's no New Testament, when he wrote this, what law of God is he talking about? The only law of God to a Jew in the first century is the law of Yahweh, of Torah. It's the Torah law. There is no New Testament. So it's critical that we look at all of the scriptures. We can't just pull out scriptures that Paul says that are ambiguous or confusing. We have to go to the clear scriptures, the law of, of uh uh, one of the, the hermeneutical principles of interpreting the scripture is the clear interprets the unclear. And this, there is no pastor that I have ever talked to, no theologian, no scholar. And I've talked to a lot from, from Dallas Theological Seminary all the way down to, to professors and deans and, and, uh, of colleges all around the, the country. No one can answer this question. There is no other interpretation other than Paul says, I want to serve the law of God. I want to deserve, serve the law of God. I delight in the law of God. Who else said that, brethren? Who else said that? David. David was the one. I delight in the law of God day and night. I meditate on it. It's a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. How can a light and a lamp of the only man in all the Bible that was said to be after God's own heart, and you cannot find a verse in the longest chapter of the Bible, Psalm 119, that is not talking about the law of God and the beauty and of the commandments and the, law, the light that it brings, the, the, the revelation that it brings into the heart when it's kept properly through the intent, the original intent of love. God will bring unbelievable revelation in your life. So the Sabbath is part of God's law. So we've got a conundrum in Christianity because Paul is telling us he serves the law of God. We know he went to church every single Saturday in every synagogue. Uh, he was going in and, and teaching the, the gospels to the Gentiles who are there. So the Sabbath is very, very, very much in prevalent uh, society. At the top, it is, it is paramount. There is no Sunday church at all. So with that in effect, that statement, let's go to the next question, which is, what about the first day of the week? So yes, what about the first day of the week? It says multiple times uh, that, uh, that, that they got together and they broke bread on the first day of the week. What does that mean? Without going into the Greek, and I've done hundreds and hundreds of hours of, of study, no joke, on the Greek phrase 
and specifically the word sabbatismos and and how it relates to the sabbath or the seventh day and what is it talking about and what does first day of the week mean um i can tell you this the very short answer is this today if i was to call a meeting okay at one o'clock a.m central standard time all right uh which day would it be it would be whatever day that 1 a.m. is on, because in Roman society right now, Gregorian calendar, the days start at midnight. So the moment that it turns 1 a.m. or 12.01, I should say, it is the next day. So I'm going to say, hey, we're meeting on Sunday at 3 a.m. All right. Now, if I meet on 3 a.m. on Monday, it's Monday. You're not going to call it Sunday because it's not. It's Monday. So the reason why, I hope that wasn't too confusing. It's important for you to understand in the first century, the days began at 6 p.m. That's how they operated, okay? It was because that was traditionally when sundown was, all okay? right? So sundown was around 6 p.m. So that's why they, they had the different uh, times during the night. The first watch uh, was from 6 to 9. The second watch was from 9 to 12. The third watch was from 12 to 3. And the fourth watch was from 3 to 6. That's why in Mark chapter 16, verse 9, I believe it was, it says that Yeshua rose from the dead during the fourth watch. And we know that because it says uh, proi, early, and that word in the Greek literally means the fourth watch. So we know that he rose from the dead between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., I love the Greek in that particular case because it gives us exactly the time that he rose from the dead or the section of time. The reason why that's important is because when you get to the first day of the week, you have to know Jewish culture to get this right. In our day, 21 centuries later, the first day of the week is Sunday, okay? And that's great. And we have church Sunday morning, the first day of the week. So we are infusing our modern understanding of when church is on the first day of the week. But that's not at all how it operated and how it happened in the first century. In the first century, what they would do, according to virtually all scholars and the Bible itself, which is the best uh, academic material, is uh, they were meeting in the synagogues on Shabbat. Okay. Uh, let me just pull this up real quickly. Okay. Acts chapter 20, verse 7, they're meeting in the afternoon, okay? Let me pull this up. I cannot talk and type at the same time. Uh, they're meeting in the afternoon, going to Shabbat. And when you go to, to the synagogue on Shabbat in the first century, before the temple was destroyed and before the Jews uh, and the Christians split, going to both Yavne uh, and Pella, uh, respectively, uh, they were all meeting together. So the, the, they were called Messianic uh, Jews. Those that believed in Yeshua that were Jewish were called Messianic Jews. And then you had the Gentiles that were coming in, and they also were Messianic, but they were not Jews. So they were, I guess today you would call them Messianic Christians. Perhaps that's what I would be called because I'm not Jewish either. But they were all meeting together. So the Gentiles that were interested in excuse me, learning more about God uh, would come to synagogue. Uh, the proselytes, the Jews were going to synagogue and the, the believing Jews were all going to synagogue. One synagogue is holding everybody. Okay. It's packing it out. Then what would happen is the natural thing would happen is like frequency would connect to like frequency. So those that were, that had homes uh, that were stronger Christians would invite the believers over for another service. So that evening they were meeting in local homes one of these nights, uh, Paul was there and he was preaching. So he's preaching on Shabbat. This is what they do, okay, in their culture. In twenty, uh, chapter 20 of Acts, verse 7, it says this. Let's just go over there. It says, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart on the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. This is the dead giveaway. It's the first day of the week. And by the way, uh, the word day is not even in the original language, although it is assumed. This is nighttime. It's Saturday night. So the moment the sun goes down in a Jewish person's mind, it's the first day of the week. 
Remember when they had to get Christ off the cross, what did they say? He says, uh, I always forget to turn this back on. Whenever they had to get Christ off the cross, what did they say? We had to get him off because the Sabbath was approaching. All right. It was preparation day. The first day of the week, or excuse me, the, the uh, first day of unleavened bread was upon them. The moment the sun goes down in the Jewish person's mind, it's the next day. It is not like it is today. They met, the, 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 the early Christians met Saturday night. It was an all-day event. Uh, some of you go to church services where there, it's an all-day event. It's a crazy exhausting. But you got the main service at the synagogue, right? Then they would break off and the Christians would go into different homes. In this case, Paul is preaching until midnight. Now you think that I'm long-winded. All right, Paul is preaching till midnight and he must have not been the most exciting because Eutychus falls asleep and falls out of the window. Or there's no, Look, there can't be anything more embarrassing to a preacher than someone falling asleep in his congregation and dying because they fell backwards and fell asleep. How is that in the local newspaper? Local man falls asleep while listening to his pastor and dies in the church. That's what happens here in Acts chapter 20. Eutychus falls out of the window and dies. And then, of course, uh, Paul says, hey, don't worry about it. He's just sleeping. He goes down, falls, up in, falls uh, upon him, and God brings him back to life, I think, to protect the ministry of Paul because that was going to hit the Jerusalem Post the next day without a doubt. So it's important for you to know that when it says they came together on the first day of the week, it is, uh, it is Saturday night, okay? Uh, that's when on the church services that they're talking about, it's Saturday night. And the dead giveaway is the fact that he's talking till midnight and also that he's leaving the next day, okay? The reason why he's leaving the next day is because Sunday was a work day. It's the first day of the week. In all of Jewish culture, Sunday is not a day of rest. That's the Roman day of rest. But for Jews, uh, this is the day that they work. And that is a big day. No different than today in our Greco-Roman uh, society. Monday morning is get down to business, get the plow in the field. It's time to go to work. It's the busiest work day of the week is Monday. And it's not a day everybody looks forward to. And that's why he's not sticking around. Have you, do you notice that? He says that he is leaving the next day. He is gone. Why? He is not sticking around for church on Sunday. It doesn't exist. He's leaving, okay? Because that's what, what he does. Uh, that's what they did in the first century. All right. <clears throat> Let's talk about Jeremiah chapter 31. There's a lot of people out there that say, hey, uh, the new covenant uh, is, is, uh, is for Gentiles, right? Well, we're not under the Old Testament Sabbath because we're Christians under the new covenant. How does this play out? Well, not outside of all the scriptures that I just went through, let's go through the most important scripture that sets the stage for all of it. And that's in Jeremiah chapter 31, 31. So let's drive over here, back to the Old Testament here, and let's look at the only scripture in the entire Old Testament that I know of that specifically prophesies about the new covenant using the phrase new covenant. In all of Christianity, it doesn't matter which seminary that you go to, which Bible college, which online course, it doesn't matter. They will all use Jeremiah 31 as the pretext, foundational scripture, to prove that there is such thing as a new covenant. Because by the time that you get to the New Testament, and it's referring to the new covenant, it is the fulfillment of the Jeremiah 31 prophecy. So let's go there and see who the prophecy is with. Jeremiah chapter 31, the whole context of chapter 31 is about the northern house of Israel, okay? There's two houses of Israel. There is the house of Israel in the north, of the ten tribes, and then there is the two tribes in the south called the house of Judah, which is modern-day Israel today that came back from captivity. So let's look at verse 31 where it says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with America, I will make a new covenant with the Christian church, not according to the covenant that I made with Israel. Does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. 
It says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. My friends, we don't even really need to go any further than this because the new covenant is not with Gentiles. It does not say that, that there, there's no house of Gentiles in this prophecy. This is why in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says that you used to be Gentiles. You used to be outside of the commonwealth of Israel. You used to be not allowed to be part of, the, of Israel. But now with Christ, he's the bridge. He's the one that, that, that bridged the gap and allows you as Gentiles to cross that bridge and to become part of the nation of Israel. God inhabits the praises, your Bible says, of his people. Go look at the Hebrew. It says God inhabits the praises of Israel. There's only one people of God, and either you're part of Israel or you're not, period. That's it. You're out of covenant or you're in covenant. And if you're in covenant, you're in the commonwealth of Israel, all right? And so he says, I'm making a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. So for those that believe that uh, we don't have to keep the Sabbath because uh, that was given to Israel, you've got a larger problem on your hands because you're going to have to prove that you're not part of the covenants of promise. You're not part of the covenant uh, 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 promise that's found inside the commonwealth of Israel. And you're going to have to prove that the new covenant was given to a Gentile people. It's not. The new covenant is open for Gentiles, but it's not with Gentiles. There's a big difference. How do I know that? Because coming out of Egypt, what happened? There was a mixed multitude that came out of Egypt. These were people that were Egyptians and from different tribes and tongues, and they were brilliant enough to see after 10 plagues, Pharaoh is not the guy I want to follow. These Israelites are a quirky people, but their God's bigger than ours. I'm going there. And they were just bright enough to follow Israel out into the wilderness. And Moses came to Yahweh and said, Yahweh, uh, look, pal, we got a problem. We got a lot of people coming out here that aren't Israelites. What do we do? And God says, uh, hey, one law, uh, I believe it's uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 49, one law for the native born and the sojourner. Just have them get circumcised, have them keep my commandments, and they'll be one with you. They will be joining the commonwealth of Israel. He never said, oh, by the way, uh, I'm going to create a different law for the multitudes uh, coming out of Egypt. Uh, I'm not. He says, I, I love them. I, I, I love all people. If they want to be in covenant with me, I will make them part of Israel. Did he not do this with Ruth, which came uh, Yeshua, the Messiah, right? King David lineage through a Moabite. Ladies and gentlemen, a mixed multitude, someone who's not in covenant, that we were commanded to never marry a Moabite and hear Boaz. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Father of Jesse is, 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 is marrying a Moabite woman. Isn't that breaking Torah? Because God said, look, it's not about the bloodline. It's about serving me, the most high God. And there is no male or female, no Jew, no Gentile. It is just covenant Israel, which means those who struggle with God, rule with God. If you want to know me, you need to struggle like Jacob. Your hip needs to be broken. You need to limp with a crutch that's got the name of Christ etched all over the wood. Because until you're crutched with Christ, you're not mine. You have to be in covenant with me. And so that is the power of understanding what real covenant is about. God's looking far beyond uh, even the firstborn. How many secondborns were chosen? I don't know. Isaac, right? Jacob. Like, there's so many. God's breaking his own rules out of love for covenant people. So sorry about that little uh, mantra there. But uh, uh, I'm passionate about this because we got to learn how to interpret Scripture and to serve God His way. We got to do it in spirit and truth. We can't just take a Scripture and say, uh, you know, it, it was only given to Israel, and then act like that's the truth when the Bible everywhere says uh, otherwise. So we've got to look into these things. All right. Um, we talked about uh, Matthew chapter 12. Um, Again, some people say, hey, didn't Jesus break the Sabbath in Matthew chapter 12, 9 through 14, when he shriveled up 
uh, when he healed the man with the shriveled hand. Uh, again, this is important. I understand that, and I can see the perspective and the viewpoint that someone might come from uh, to say that he broke the Sabbath. But again, two points. One, if he's breaking the Sabbath according to God's law, he's a sinner, and he needs a Savior, and he can't be the Savior if he's a sinner in need of a Savior. Two, there was no law that said that you can't heal on the Sabbath, but there was one in Judaism. Uh, their traditions said that you could not heal on the Sabbath. That was work. I don't know I, 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 why on earth and how on earth they could come up with the, these particular laws, but they did. So when Yeshua uh, healed someone on the Sabbath, to them, he was breaking the law, but he wasn't breaking God's law. He was breaking Jewish law. There's a big difference. It's also really important if you're going to learn biblical uh, interpretation and understanding scripture to know that the Jewish people in the first century, just like many sects of Judaism today, they had the oral law, okay, of the rabbis, the, the, the man-made traditions, which not are not are all bad at all. Like some of them are fantastic, really good ideas. And then there is the law of God over here. This microphone's in my way. Um, and they looked at all of it as God's law, and they called it the law of God, which can be confusing when you're looking at Scripture and you don't know that because it will appear in these private letters uh, that Paul has going between one person and another person that it's understood which law they're talking about. But for us, 20 centuries later, we're not sure. And if you're not taught that there are two different laws that are in operation and they were both called the law of God, it can appear as if Paul is against the law, but he's not. Uh, he, you have to understand which law he's referring to at different times. So in this particular uh, stage of Matthew uh, section, I should say of Matthew chapter 12, he's, he's, uh, this is Jewish law, tradition that Jesus is breaking. And he's really good at breaking the tradition. And I love that about Jesus. He's a maverick. He's a rebel, but he's also crazy respectful when it comes to his own law. All right, let's go to a difficult one. So it seems Colossians chapter two, doesn't it say this? What about Colossians chapter two, 14? Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that are against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Let's talk about that for just a second. And uh, because this was brought up by a pastor talking about the Sabbath. That, Look, we don't have to keep the Sabbath. It was nailed to the cross. Think about what we're saying, ladies and gentlemen. The Sabbath was made for man in the beginning of time, in the seventh day of creation. It's a blessing to not have to work it is a blessing to rest. It is a blessing to be with your spouse, okay, on the Shabbat and your family. And all of a sudden, the very biggest blessing that God ever made in the first chapter of the Bible, in, this, in the first and second chapter of the Bible, in creation, God sides, we're getting rid of that blessing. We're, we're killing it. I'm nailing it to the cross. The Sabbath is the problem, okay, of man. Uh, when we know scientifically uh, that uh, people that keep the Sabbath uh, literally live 10 years longer. That, that, that is a scientific uh, study that they did of Seventh-day Adventists, which I am not one. Uh, but the Seventh-day Adventists were the only really people group in Christianity that were keeping the Sabbath. And it's been proven that they live 10 years longer. That's crazy uh, to me. So God is not removing the Sabbath and nailing it to the cross. But let's find out what he is. Let's go. Chapter 2 of Galatians says this. Uh, let's back up here. Um, here we go. In verse 13, and you, let me highlight it for you, and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all your sins. Guys, all we got to do is read this, the context. This is about sins, okay? He's forgiving trespasses. Watch this. Having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Now, I get it. If we all grow up and we, we believe that God's Sabbath is done away with and the law is done away with, these type of verses sure seem to support 
that idea. Although we just came from Paul telling us in Romans chapter 7 and 8 uh, and 6, 1, that the, the law is not done away with. He loves it. He, he delights in it. He wants to keep it, right? And those that are carnal don't do it, and those that are spiritual do, right? So how do we rectify what he's saying now to the Colossians? Is he drastically changing his mind? Uh, of course not. He's saying, look, we were all dead in our sins. Christ took our sins and nailed them to the cross. Go look up, I wish I had it in front of me, the actual Aramaic on this verse. And it's, 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 it tells you right there. He literally nailed the bonds of sin is what it actually says. It is not the law that was contrary to you. It's only contrary to you when you break it. You get tickets when you go through a stop sign or when you speed. God took the tickets, nailed it to the cross. You know what that's called? The curse of the law. It does not say the law is a curse. It is only a curse if you break it. The Bible says that I set before you blessings and curses. Blessings if you keep it, curses if you don't. So if you break God's law, you're under indictment. There is a ticket against you. You can't ever enter the kingdom of heaven on judgment day if you have a single ticket on your record. You can't do it or heaven won't be perfect. So this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, my friends. He came, he took the tickets, he took the breaking of his law, and he put it on his own shoulders, nailed it to the cross with his own blood, with his own hands, and he said, to tell us die, it is finished. And in the process of doing that, all the principalities and powers were disarmed. Why were they disarmed? Because God took away his law and took away the definition of sin so everybody can do whatever's right in their own eyes. That would arm them. No, disarming Satan was saying, you can't pin this on my people anymore. There's no way. You cannot take the law of God and the indictments and accuse them before my throne because I'm paying for all of their sin. Amen and amen and hallelujah. Somebody screaming at the top of your lungs. Salvation is dependent on, Galat on Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, that Christ penetrated the hearts of men, pulled out the indictments that were pinned to our hearts, and he nailed them to the cross so that we could be free. Nothing to do with, uh, with the God disarming and taking away his own law. May, may it never be. Let's go back to, to Colossians chapter 2 and deal with the next verse, because this one is brought up a lot too. What about Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. It says, It says, So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, okay? Which are shadows of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. This is a really important verse. And so I want to talk about this for just a second. This appears to say, Hey, don't let anybody tell you that you have to keep the Sabbath. Don't let them judge you for that. I'm going to suggest to you that the context suggests the opposite. What Paul is saying is he's got a group of people that are just like the, the circumcision party coming down from Jerusalem that's bothering his churches in Galatia over circumcision. The same type of people are bothering other churches, this one in Colossae, the church of the Colossians, and they are saying, uh, they're judging his people for the way that they're keeping the Sabbath and their new moons and, their, and, the, and the festivals of God. Paul is teaching them how to keep the Shabbat, teaching them how to keep the festivals, but divorcing them from the traditions and doctrines of men that are damaging. All right. And they don't like that. So they're coming down and they're saying, you're keeping the Sabbath wrong. Uh, some of you out there, some of you know people, I call them Torah terrorists. They're all into the Sabbath. They're all in the feast days and they're all into telling everybody how they're doing it wrong. OK, uh, I, I like to say, mind your own business, keep the Sabbath the way you want to keep it and let God convict the hearts and the minds of people that are trying to learn how to serve him through love. OK, so all that to be say, I know someone's going to write me and say, boy, Jim, Pastor Jim is really fired up today. Calm down. Uh, well, that's what happens when I have a double shot of espresso before I start up a live broadcast. And I'm talking about something that's passionate uh, that I, I believe in. And we've got to get right. OK, so here's what he's saying. How do I know, by the way, that this is not talking about uh, keeping God's uh, Sabbath? Because if we keep reading again, 
Text and context tell us everything. Here we go. It says this. Let's keep reading. Shadows of things to come. Verse uh, 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourself to regulations of the world? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. Listen carefully. Stop texting. Listen. According to the commandments and doctrines of men. This whole section is not about the Sabbath. It's not about the feast days of God. Paul is detailing what these commandments are, what these regulations are, okay? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. These are all oral law. These are all the traditions and doctrines of men. The Sabbath is not a tradition and doctrine of men. He's not saying, don't let anyone judge you for eating uh, you know, unclean animals like it's taught or uh, regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. No, he's saying, don't let these cats from Jerusalem judge you for the way I've taught you how to keep Shabbat without their regulations, without the traditions and doctrines of men. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, and, uh, and we can, we can get to the bottom of this. All right. Almost finished here with, with, uh, with part one here of defending the Sabbath. We got a couple more questions. All right. Galatians chapter five, verse four was brought up in a video that I saw saying that, look, we don't have to keep the Sabbath because Galatians chapter five, verse four says this. So let's read it together. It says, you have become estranged from Christ. You who attempt to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. So this pastor began to explain that, look, if you keep the Sabbath, you've fallen from grace. And I will say this, I absolutely agree. Listen, read my lips. If you keep the Sabbath, you have fallen from grace. I'm smirking because there's a dot, dot, dot after this. If you're keeping the Sabbath for salvation, if you're keeping the Sabbath for salvation, you've fallen from grace. That's what it says. How do we know that? Because it says, excuse me, you've become estranged from Christ. If you attempt to be justified, what does justified mean? Saved. If you attempt to be saved by keeping a single commandment, you've fallen from grace. And I agree. The problem is this pastor and many Christians are are, are reading and into this, this scripture something that's not there. They're changing the word justified to uh, sanctified. They're changing it to uh, following the law. Uh, no, you're not estranged from Christ by following Christ, uh, by following God's law. You're estranged from Christ if you're following God's law for any other reason because you love him and because you want to know more about him and you want to please him. Uh, more than you did yesterday, period. I want to love my wife more than I did yesterday. It doesn't make me legalistic because I want to follow the ninth commandment and be faithful, uh, right? Or or what have you, it, or, or the seventh commandment. It means that I want to follow God's commandments because I love him and I want to be more in love with Christ. I want to be a better believer in Christ, okay? All right, and the very last one we'll deal with today before we get to uh, uh, next week, and I'm going to go back through here, by the way, and I'm going to, because there's just so many questions, I'll go back through all of the text. I will pick out the right questions, uh, the questions I didn't get to answer, and I will answer those uh, in, a next, in the next broadcast, okay? Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. We're on a marathon here, ladies and gentlemen. Apostle John is in the is the island of, of Patmos. He's isolated and he's got these visions of what's going on at the end of time. All right. The revelation is about what happens during the Great Tribulation. It's at the very end of time. And he says this. I was in the spirit. Let me pull it up for you. Hopefully it'll be more uh, easier to follow along. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a voice, a loud voice as of a trumpet. Okay, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write it in a book and send it to the seven churches, blah, blah, blah. Here we go. It is often said that the Lord's Day is Sunday. And therefore, uh, right here, 
it says that we should be keeping the Sabbath on the Lord's day. John is uh, is in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day is Sunday. So therefore, John was uh, in the spirit on Sunday. Uh, this is all kinds of problem. Uh, and here's why. Uh, this is this is this is uh, uh, this is eisegesis. This is reading into the text uh, something that doesn't exist. And here's why: the term "the Lord's Day," which, by the way, this is the only time in all of the Bible that this phrase is used. The term "the Lord's Day" was never designated for Sunday until centuries later. Okay, it was centuries later that the that the Gentile, the Roman Gentile budding church. Uh, decided to move the Shabbat from Saturday to Sunday, and they pulled this verse out of Revelation and said, this is the Lord's day. It's Sunday because he rose from the dead So on the Sunday. And that's a fact. He did rise from the dead on Sunday, but that has nothing to do with changing the Sabbath, okay? But the Roman church, who was already uh, before serving Christ, serving uh, the sun god on Sun's day, which was the first day of the week, conveniently decided to make it easy for Rome to convert to Christianity by allowing them to maintain their current uh, day of worship, which was on the first day of the week, Sunday, and they swapped out a Saturday for Sunday, didn't want to have anything in common with the Jews, and then needed a scripture uh, to, to connect to that, and they pulled out uh, Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. What's fascinating about the academic side of this is the Aramaic, the ancient Aramaic Peshitta actually says Maria uh, in the text. The Aramaic word for Lord's Day is Maria, uh, which is Master Yahweh's Day. All right. So if it was Sunday, I can promise you it wouldn't be Master Yahweh's Day. So there's only two viable real academic uh, uh, solutions, interpretations to this particular verse. Either number one, Master Yahweh's day is referring to the only day that God has ever set aside for himself, which is the seventh day, the Shabbat, or, and more likely, uh, it is Master Yahweh's day in the context of the last, of the voice of the last trumpet in all of the prophets would be judgment day. Uh, the day of the Lord, as the prophets call it. So the day of the Lord in the Old Testament was referring to judgment day. It was the prophets were receiving from God uh, about what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. And it is John on the island of Patmos who is taken out of his body to that day on the day of the Lord. And he hears the sound of the trumpet and God is Yeshua, the Alpha and Omega is giving him instructions on what's going to happen on the day of the Lord. So it's one of those two. I lean towards the, 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 the larger context of Scripture in the Old Testament talking about Judgment Day is the day of the Lord, because all of Revelation is all about the day of the Lord. And uh, he says, I'm in the Spirit on the Judgment Day, on the day of the Lord. And so it's either he's in the Spirit on Shabbat, uh, and he has this vision about Judgment Day, or God is taking him in the Spirit to Judgment Day, which is the Day of the Lord. Okay, uh, so let's go ahead and stop there. We've we've been going for quite some time. This has uh, been a, a marathon of going through a ton of questions. I promise you I will go through more in our next broadcast. This is going to be a multi-part series developing a playlist on the Sabbath. And all of these will be broken down into individual uh, individual questions, okay? So when, when I answer a question, we'll turn those into passion points, and you can find them on our website, and then you can put those, uh, push those and share those to different friends and family, okay? So uh, before I take off here today, let's go to this commercial break. This is really important because Christmas is coming up. Really important. Here we go. Was Jesus actually born on December 25th? Why do we celebrate Christmas on the winter solstice? And did the Catholic Church originally choose December 25th just because it was an existing pagan holiday to a Roman solar god? We're gonna find out all of this and more as we travel back in time 
over 2,000 years ago, looking at Egyptian hieroglyphics, Roman poetry. We'll even dive into the writings of ancient church fathers and Catholic bishops and find out what they have to say about the topic. We're gonna to get to the bottom of this. Let's put December 25th on trial, my friends, and find out what the Roman church is actually trying to hide right after this.